We come before our Lord this morning to be reminded about the grace that comes through Jesus Christ. But we also remind, are reminded about our sins. And we have a moment and a time to acknowledge our sins before the Lord. And we'll do so with the litany, which is on the screen. Lord, you said, if you love me, you obey what I command. Forgive us our lukewarm love and our disobedience. Lord, you said, you may ask for anything in my name. Forgive us when we think we need to solve our own problems. Lord, you said, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We confess that our lives are often consumed by worry and anxiety. Lord, you said, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Forgive us our barren lives, Lord. Lord, you said you must testify, for you have been with me. We confess, Lord, that too often we have been silent. Lord, you said, love each other as I have loved you. In this and in so many ways, we confess our failures and crimes. Let's confess our sins in a silent prayer. Merciful God, you made us in your image with a mind to know you, a heart to trust you, and a will to serve you. But our knowledge is inadequate, our trust imperfect, and our obedience incomplete. Day by day we fail to grow into your likeness. In your tender love, Lord, forgive us. Through the power of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and confess our faith together, and we'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let's say our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and ascended in heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
This morning, we're beginning a new sermon series on questions. And they're your questions that you've been posing to Ashley and I over the course of about a month. Um, these are your questions that we compiled and our course last week we had in the bulletin in that green bookmark. I couldn't remember what that was. Green bookmark. And we'll be preaching on your questions for the next two months or about eight weeks. And we're going to break a little bit from the traditional. The traditional is, of course, you read a passage in Scripture and then you preach on the passage. But Pastor Ashley and I have found it difficult to find one passage to answer all the questions that we'll be dealing with each Sunday. And so our promise to you is that we will always use Scripture as much as possible in answering the questions, since Scripture is our only rule and guide for life. But we won't be reading a passage like we normally do and then preaching on the passage. Instead, we'll be using Scripture to answer your questions that you have about faith, God, the church. And we'll be considering two questions this morning as we start this sermon series. Number one, who is saved? And two, can you lose your salvation? Who is saved and can you lose your salvation? Before we start our sermon this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray for your spirit this morning. Be present in this place. Help us to have wisdom as we consider pertinent questions about faith and Jesus Christ. Give us wisdom and insight through your scriptures, through your word, and help us to write your will upon our hearts, to know it and live it faithfully each and every day. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Who is saved? And can you lose your salvation? I'm going to take first question first. Who is saved? And I have to admit, we didn't actually receive that question or worded like that as a question. But we received many other questions that dealt with that. People asking, what exactly do you need to be saved? And another question, do you have to belong to a certain denomination to be saved? Will you see other denominations in heaven? Is it not just what you believe, but also being part of a church? Is that part of being saved? What exactly is the bare minimum to being saved? And what happens when churches go through discussions and divide over doctrine? And these are good questions because, of course, we come across this. We come across things that we wonder about. We wonder about the person, the friend, the co-worker who says, I believe there's a God, and I'm good. And you wonder, is that it? Is that all you need? We wonder about it sometimes when churches are going through times of discussion and they're deeply divided over doctrines about baptism or the Holy Spirit and they're discussing all these things. And you wonder, I don't agree with this doctrine. Am I in trouble? You can wonder about it when you hear of churches which require not just believing a certain thing, but their membership has to be a part of that church or that denomination. And you wonder, is that part of that too? These questions come up. Who is saved? Who is saved? We can worry about these things, wonder about these things. Because we say as a church to have faith in Jesus Christ. That is what we say as a church. Faith has a knowledge component. Faith is not just an emotion. It's not just a feeling. It has knowledge to it. We believe in something. And we believe in a certain something. Scripture seems to make that abundantly clear. You can't just believe in anything and expect to be saved. There's something you particular you have to believe in. Read the book of Galatians, the entire letter of Paul to the church in Galatians. Paul is writing to them because they no longer are believing in the gospel, and he is writing frantically to them to help them give up what they believe and to believe the truth of Jesus Christ again. Certainly, there is a false belief for Paul. And if there's a false belief, then there's a true belief. 
So what is that true belief? What is the bare minimum true belief? This is the best way I know how to summarize it, knowing Scripture. The bare minimum is this. We are sinful and deserve judgment. But Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, bore your sins on the cross and died paying the penalty for those sins. He rose again on the third day as proof of a new life in him and pours out salvation as a gift of grace to those who believe in him. That is it. That's the bare minimum truth of Christianity. Christ died for your sins and he rose again to a new life now possible with him. That's what many passages in Scripture talk about, and two of them in particular. Romans 10, verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Ephesians 2 highlights the grace and mercy. It says this, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And there's many other passages passages in Scripture I could quote, but that's it. This is the simple Christian faith we should return to again and again and again, because our faith is simple. But it is profound because we believe that though we didn't earn it or deserve it, Jesus Christ paid for our sins. Those who believe are saved. I was thinking this week about the simplicity and yet profoundness of our belief. Knowing that Christian faith is simple, though, doesn't always help us reply to people in situations such as someone who says, I believe there is a God and thinks that's good enough. It doesn't always help when churches are going and arguing over doctrines. It doesn't always give us a reply, the churches that hold, that they alone hold the keys to heaven. So with all these issues that test whether simple declaration, that simple declaration is enough, what do you say to them? And I was looking and I remembered the words of the Heilberg Catechism. If you want to turn and you have the Grace Psalter hymnal, And in the back, I'm just going to read the question and answer, but if you want to follow along, page 867 in the back, which is question and answer 22 in the Heilberg Catechism. It has a very useful thing to say to this. What then must a Christian believe? The answer is this, everything God promised us in the gospel, we have to believe everything that God promised us in the gospel. That gospel is summarized for us in the articles of our Christian faith, a creed beyond doubt and confessed throughout the world. That gospel is summarized for us in the articles of our Christian faith, a creed beyond doubt and confessed throughout the world. What creed is that? If you turn the page, it's the Apostles' Creed. The Halberd Catechism says if you need help and you need a tool understanding who is saved, turn to the Apostles' Creed. And I think it's a good answer. It says we have to believe the gospel and all of God's promises in the gospel. But then it says go to the oldest confession in the Christian church and use this. It is a perfect summary of the Christian faith. The origins of the Apostle Creed are from the first century and may have even be used during the time of the Apostles. But certainly it is the first consistent statement of what we believe for the Christian church for the last 2,000 years. And every Christian tradition holds it as true. The Apostles Creed is a good tool in answering who is saved. To the person who says, I believe there's a God, 
and it's all good. Well, God can do whatever God wants, and God saves whoever he wants. The creed gives you a baseline to say they're probably missing something. It's not saying that there's a God. They're missing the deep and wonderful forgiveness found in Jesus Christ. To those who wonder if they disagree with a certain doctrine in the church, does that mean I'm going to lose my salvation? Is am I going to get kicked out of the kingdom of heaven? It gives you a guideline to go to and say, yes, I still believe in God the Father and Christ and forgiveness of sins, and I believe all these things. So I'm not going to get shoved out of the kingdom of God. The Apostles' Creed is a good tool for showing us if a church or even a denomination or a cult is so far from the path that they've walked from, from the light into darkness. It teaches us. The Creed can teach us the basis of Christianity and gives us a foundation for saying if a church is not where it's supposed to be, if it's looking for human wisdom and misusing the Scriptures. And the Creed and Scripture certainly shows us that no single church or denomination has a monopoly on salvation. You may not realize that every time you read the Apostles' Creed, but it's there. It's there in the eighth line. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Faith isn't just believing a certain something. It's also a deep-rooted conviction that what we believe is true. That's found in Hebrews 11. A deep-rooted conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And no church, no single church, no single church tradition or denomination has the power to give the Holy Spirit to someone. Only God can. Romans 5 says this, 5.5 5 says this, Hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. One of the marks of a Christian is the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. Paul, in almost every letter in the New Testament, calls us to live according to that spirit. No one church, Catholic, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Reformed, no one church is the only true church. Because I know that many churches from many different places has filled with people who have the Holy Spirit in them. They believe in the gospel and God has poured out his spirit into them. And it, they are saved. The Holy Spirit is in many different people from many different denominations. Will we see other denominations in heaven? That was one of the questions we got. The answer is there real, really won't be any denomination in heaven. Even while we divide churches here on earth into different camps and traditions, there is only one church in heaven. And, that, and the citizens of that heavenly church are those who call Jesus Christ their Lord. God saves those who believe in him. Those who believe that sin deserves death, but yet Christ died for me. And God, and God knows who is his because he's poured out his Holy Spirit into them. Who's saved? We are. We who believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior, who carry the Holy Spirit and seek to live as his people. That's the truth of Christianity. Okay, now to the harder question. Can I take off my tie? Did I just get an applause? <laughs> And this is the question that makes me sweat. Can you lose your salvation? Whew. There's really two reasons to ask that question. One is you are afraid of losing your salvation. And the other is you wonder if someone else has lost theirs. And both are good reasons to ask that question especially if for some reason you are afraid of losing your salvation. No one except ourselves know how terrible we are. When you have to go to your knees on a Sunday morning and confess your sins and you start running through the list, you know how sinful you can be. And so we had a question. 
Does God forgive sins of believers as they happen or only as they ask? That is, if a person dies while sinning or without asking for forgiveness for their sins, are they condemned? And it's a good question. Am I still forgiven? After everything I do, am I still forgiven? The short answer is yes, you are. You don't need to continually ask for forgiveness. And if you are afraid of losing your salvation, you're probably not going to lose your salvation. In fact, I would say if you are afraid of losing your salvation, you will not lose your salvation because your faith matters to you. Martin Luther dealt with this question. Martin Luther is, accord, 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 is of course, uh, the great reformer who broke from the Catholic Church in 1521. Martin Luther spent most of his life, early life, as a monk, locked in his cell or in the prayer chapel, for asking for forgiveness for every sin, hours and hours and hours and hours a day, praying for forgiveness for every little thing he did, not wanting to see hell. Until he started reading scripture and he found there the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And he came across the certain truth that Christ forgives all our sins. Colossians 2 has these wonderful words. 2.13 When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. All our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. Christ took all our sins and forgave them. When we first believe, all our future sins, past sins, present sins, were no longer held against us. Nothing. Not one of them. Not one of those sins mattered to God. What mattered was that Christ died for you. If you believe in your heart that Christ died for you, that no single sin, great or small, no amount of sin can take away that salvation. That's the profoundness of what we believe. No sin triumphs over Christ's forgiveness. So why do we still ask for forgiveness on a Sunday morning? Why do we still confess our sins? Should we stop because it's no longer necessary? Well, it isn't necessary to ask for forgiveness each day to continue being saved. But confession is still a good thing. James 5.16 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James says the church should confess your sins to each other so that you can lift each other up in prayer and be healed. By healed, he means being healed from your sinful habits. If you can go on your knees each day and confess your sins, your vulgar language, sooner or later, you're probably going to start working on getting rid of your vulgar language. If you confess to someone else your sins, they hold you accountable to those sins. That's what James is talking about. Confession is a good way to be reminded that we are still sinful. We still need God's forgiveness. We still need to be humble, and we still need to look to him. Confession is a good thing that does all that. Confession is not how we stay saved. We're saved because we believe, and we believe that Christ saved us from all our sins. So what about others who were Christians and then left the church and left the faith and no longer believe at all? Did they lose their salvation, or were they not truly believers to begin with? Those are really the two options. And which one is the right one? All right, now I'm sweating. <laughs> the best way I can answer it is this. If you believe that salvation, how salvation works is that it's primarily a human decision, God is the one who does the saving, but it's humans who choose God, then you probably lean towards humans can lose their salvation. 
If humans are the ones who ask God for forgiveness, God saves them, but they're the ones who do the asking, and it's primarily a human decision, then it certainly humans in their fickleness can lose their salvation. If you believe that salvation is primarily God-centered, God is the one who softens hearts, God is the one who speaks salvation to us, there is a human decision, but it's mostly about what God is doing, then you tend to think that you can't lose your salvation because you can't lose something that God gives. People then are in the church for a time, and when that time is done, then they walk out of the church. But they weren't really saved to begin with. I think that's the best way to really describe that. If you believe it's a human decision, you probably will believe that you can lose your salvation. If you believe it is God-centered, then you will probably believe that you can't. The CRC, the Reformed tradition, takes the God-centered approach, more or less. We believe there is a human decision involved, but it is primarily what God is doing. It is God who saves us. It is God's gift. And then it is people who are in a church for a time, and then they leave. And I know that's not an answer many people are satisfied with. It's not an answer many people like. I know it seems cruel, and it leaves us with questions about why God isn't working in the life of this person. Why isn't he doing something? They were raised in a church. Why didn't God save them? I don't have the answers. I really don't. But I know, and I know the answer will not satisfy many people. But this is what I take comfort in. When we believe, when we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we are saved. And that salvation is utter and complete. The proof of salvation is the presence of the Holy Spirit and God lives in us. I can't see God just packing up shop because all of a sudden we don't believe anymore. All right, take comfort in the fact that our salvation is really not dependent on ourselves. Because it is, if it was, we all, all of us, wouldn't be saved for long. Salvation isn't dependent upon our unfaithfulness. It's dependent upon God's faithfulness. Who is saved? Those who believe. And I'm certain that we will be shocked as to who believes in heaven and in the afterlife, because I know that many people believe, even if they're not the most faithful outside. Can you lose that salvation? I don't think so. I don't think you can lose what God gives. I truly believe that from the first moments we utter faith in our hearts, God is there, and he's with us always. And even though people go through dark times and can sometimes leave the church, sometimes they come back. And God is with them in their belief all the time. And I believe that God is with us every day. That salvation is for everyone who believes, and that for those who do believe, God is present always. He's present in our lives till the day he takes us and shows us before the throne room in heaven as his people. That's what I believe. To the question who are saved, those who call Jesus Christ their Lord in true faith, who carry the Holy Spirit, and God knows who they are. And can you lose that salvation? I don't think so. I don't think so. God doesn't take back what he gives, that wonderful gift of grace. And he's with that gift and with us each and every day. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, we look at questions that people have. And Lord, we know that sometimes these lead to new questions, and sometimes these questions are hard to hear. But Lord, behind everything is your wonderful gift of grace. You have poured out your grace to us as your people each and every day. Lord, help us to believe in you strongly. Help us to grow in faith. Help us to proclaim our faith. 
Lord, we take comfort that this is something that isn't built our, on our unfaithfulness, but your faithfulness. Lord, we ask that you be with us as your people. Lord, continue to guide us as your church. Continue to be with us as the next couple weeks, two months, we look at questions and delve into questions concerning what's on our hearts. We ask that you be with us and give us the wisdom and give us insight into our own faith. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and sing. I don't have a bulletin. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Number 615. Let's stand and sing.